Hi, everybody. Hey, everyone. Thanks for coming to my talk. All right, so we're going to get started because we're a couple minutes behind. Um, all right, so thanks so much for coming uh, to my talk, Why You Don't Need an Army to Run Long-Term Diary Studies. So I'm going to jump right in. Uh, introduce myself a little bit. So, hi, my name is Lainey. Uh, I got my start in user research as an indie at a game studio that I helped found in Salt Lake City. And I did three years there, kind of working on really small projects, really scrappy research, very low budget, very small teams, uh, doing a lot of contract work. And about a year and a half ago, I moved to Ubisoft Montreal, so the exact opposite of what I was doing, working on very large teams, working embedded with the design teams and doing a lot of really different things, working on a lot of really big, different projects. At Ubisoft Montreal, I am an embedded researcher on Rainbow Six Siege. So I am sit directly on the production floor with the design team, and I've been sitting there for about a year working with them, uh, and it's been a really cool experience to have that kind of embedded researcher experience. Today I want to talk about how we maximize long-term impact from research with our production team by running an exploratory long-term diary study over several different months with only three people on our team. So, but I want to talk a little bit about R6, just for any of you that are maybe not as familiar with it, because we're going to be talking a lot about it. So Rainbow Six Siege is a 5v5 PvP tactical shooter. We have a global esports team, 45 million players across the world. And we have a lot of different kinds of content in the, this live game. So we have three different game modes, two different playlists, 46 playable operators, 20 different maps, and new content being released every three months. This makes for a lot of challenges and a lot of things to learn when you're starting to get into the game. And all these kind of things coming into the game every few months creates a really interesting shifting meta within the game. And that creates a, something that's quite challenging, even for players of very high skill level, to really master and to learn. So we need to do this, but really, why are we deciding to do a diary study now? The game's been out for a few years, um, so why now? Well, it's been a few years after release, and we're still regularly seeing a lot of these comments online. So we're seeing a lot of reviews, we're seeing a lot of comments on just Reddit and things like that, saying that there, our game is challenging, it's difficult, and that's not actually our problem that we're upset about. We want the game to be difficult, but we, we want to ensure that we know where it's difficult and why it's difficult, and we want to be able to control that as much as possible. What we didn't know is how all these different layers over several different years, all of these pieces were building together and what that was starting to mean for the game. We had a lot of assumptions about where these barriers were happening, but we wanted to start getting some really ev some, some evidence to support how we could start moving forward. With new content releasing every three months, the, the development train was moving rapidly in front of us. And we knew that it was time to really get be able to jump ahead and start getting in front of the train and being able to be more proactive in the type of research that we were able to run. So our solution to begin to tackle this was what we called the learning study. So this is a long-term diary study of new players of Rainbow Six Siege. So our goal was to increase our knowledge on how players are learning the game right now. So the game in its current state, several years after release, what's happening in the moment right now with our players? How are they learning? And how can we increase our own knowledge to be able to better understand that experience for our players? With this goal in mind, we created a roadmap. And we started to think about what it actually would mean to run a long-term diary study. The initial concern was that we didn't actually have a lot of people resources. We knew that measuring something like learning was going to take an extremely long period of time, but we didn't actually have a lot of people that we could have on this full time for however many weeks we decided we wanted to do this. So we needed to start thinking how we could efficiently break this up into kind of more manageable segments. And we created two phases, phase one, phase two, uh, and phase two would be the, the diary study, the kind of extended portion of the study. Phase one was just going to be myself. Um, I was going to be running players on my own. And my goal here was really looking at, can we understand the behaviors and skills and performance of our current players? So I really wanted to get an idea of what does it mean for the people that have been playing this game for hundreds of hours? 
What do they look like? How do they behave? What are they doing? I really wanted to create a baseline for what learning looked like. So I decided to do that in phase one. Phase two, I'd be joined by two additional researchers, and the three of us would spend this kind of extended period of time understanding the learning curve of new players. So we're gonna work our way back, and we're gonna start with new fresh players and start to see if we could start mapping out how players were actually learning the game and how these pieces were starting to join together. At this point, we, we needed to explore the full capabilities of running a longer term study. Measuring learning wasn't gonna be something we were gonna be able to do in two, three, or even four weeks, we knew this. We didn't exactly know at this point how long we wanted to go. We were planning anywhere from about eight to 12 weeks. We were still trying to figure out exactly how long that was gonna take. But we knew that the important thing was is that we wanted to be able to follow players as they experience the game as naturally as possible um, over that extended period of time. At this point, no one in our lab had run anything like this. Um, we hadn't run diary studies to this scale before. So we decided to kind of look at the tools and the resources that we had internally from previous research and see how we could maybe adapt them to work over the course of a much extended study. So I wanna talk a little bit about phase one first. Uh, this was an interesting portion because evaluating learning would be much more exploratory than a lot of the research that we were really accustomed to doing in our lab. It would require a lot more kind of planning on knowing where to start um, and not always knowing when it was gonna end. We, didn't, we couldn't always plan out exactly how players were gonna do this and we didn't really wanna prescribe onto them what was gonna be happening. So since I was gonna be working alone in this point, I decided that I wanted to take the time to really understand what was going on in the game right now and use this as kind of the planning and piloting phase for the second portion of the study so that we could basically just roll straight into a long-term diary study. And since I was by myself, it was also really important that I wanted to get the team involved as early as possible. So we wanted to get them involved right at the beginning stages and see if I could rely on them a bit more to be more involved in the research. This was something extremely different that we had never done on our team before. So getting them kind of to get that buy-in really early was gonna be really important. So I sat down with the team and we wanted to discuss what does it take to be an average player? We didn't really know exactly how we wanted to measure learning. We didn't know exactly how we wanted to break down the game. How did we define what it means to learn the game? What are the different metrics that we want to do? So we sat down as a team and we thought, what do we expect players to be able to do? What are the types of behaviors that we expect someone that we consider to be average? How do we measure that? Is it tracking? Is it observations? How do we get this information? Based on our tracking data, which we have loads of, we, were, we had a pretty good idea of what the, the statistics of an average player looked like, but of course that was only one small piece of what we were looking at. We didn't have a lot of context about how players were making decisions about what they were doing, how these pieces are kind of all fit together over time, were they getting information from other people, was that helping them influence their learning experience, and what did all of this look like? So we really had to figure out how we could get what we needed kind of around the tracking data without getting completely lost in the weeds at this point because I have so much content in the game, if I decided to break down every single one of those things, I'd be doing this for years and I just didn't have time to do that. So the question we really wanted to answer was, what do we expect them to do? And so we started by writing out performance statements and this is how we would begin to think about how we were gonna define our KPIs. So we sat down with the team and we came up with a very long list of expected performance statements. Um, and some of them looked something like this. Uh, droning is a very important aspect of the game in Siege, not only as an indiv individual player, but also as playing with your team. Gaining intel and being able to have that upper hand on the other team is, is critical. So this was one of the key facets that we ended up looking at was this intel and within that was droning. So the design team says we want, we expect average players to be decent at droning. Well, what does that mean? Well, they said, we would expect that players are gonna drone at least once per round after prep phase, and that they're gonna use their second drone throughout the, throughout the round 70% of the time. This was the number that they gave me. So I said, okay, uh, so we've got this. Uh, now, how do I actually roll this into something that I can use and be able to develop my KPIs? 
we started asking a lot more questions and thinking about uh, how can we drill this down? What types of things can we look at from tracking? What types of things can we get from observations? Are there things that we are able to ask the players directly? Where, where can we start to get this information of how do we measure whether a player will have decent droning and kind of when this moment will actually occur? This was a really important step for us because we didn't want to break down every single thing into every little micro chunk. So this really helped us to start building constraints about what it meant to be able to do different things in the game. So within the droning, we were able to say, we felt a bit more comfortable about, okay, we, we know we want to be paying attention to what players are doing when they're droning. Where are they going with the drone? What are they doing? Are they making call outs? Are they talking with their team? Are they trying to preserve the drone? And so this got a really good conversation going about, okay, what are kind of the, the constraints of what we want to measure here? Because we knew that we didn't want to try and just do every single possible data point that we could from tracking. So we got our list of expected performance statements from the team. We broke down the KPIs very quickly in just a matter of a couple weeks, and we rolled straight into phase one. I did this by myself. We had eight players. They came into the lab. They brought all their own peripherals. They logged into the live version of the game, and we told them to text, call their friends, play online, do however you would play at home, and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna sit back here and I'm gonna watch you. So I sat with them as they played online over the course of two days. So they played a lot of matches and I spent a lot of time talking with them. After a match, I'd ask them how it went. What did they do? What were they trying to do? Were they able to do the things that they were trying to do? And how do, you, how do they feel like they could have done something better or differently if they were given this situation in the, in the future? I also gave them kind of different scenarios. We went into different portions of the game and I asked them to set up different things or think about different strategies that they would use given different team compositions or map layouts. And I did this with eight players over the course of a few weeks. And this was our phase one. This was something that was really critical for us being able to be prepared moving in to the diary study. It was really important that we actually, I gained, I personally, because I was sitting with all these players for a very long time, gained a really good understanding of the current player behaviors. Not only did I have a really good idea of how players actually, the terminology that they used when they were discussing different aspects in the game, being able to identify misunderstandings about how mechanics were actually functioning, and thinking about kind of what our benchmark for learning was. At this point, we didn't know when the diary study was going to end. So we wanted to look at, if we brought in players that had played around 100 hours, do we feel pretty comfortable that we could follow players over the course of 80 to 100 hours and get an idea of what that learning curve looked like. So we wrapped phase one and we started to move into phase two. It was at this point that we decided that we were gonna run the diary study for 10 weeks. Based on what we had seen and the number of hours the players had had that came in from phase one, I felt pretty confident that after about 100 hours, I could reliably start to see patterns in how you were playing in the game and kind of what was going on. And you'd be able to start to hit this kind of benchmark of what it meant to be kind of the average player. I realize 100 hours sounds like a long time for a game, but that's kind of where we're at. So we started, we moved immediately into prep for phase two. I was joined by two other researchers and we had two weeks to make a lot of decisions about how we were gonna run a 10 week long diary study. One of the first conversations that we started to have was really thinking about how, where are we gonna have these players? Are we gonna have them come in to the lab or are we gonna be able to host them online? What is that, how are we gonna do this? I was initially quite concerned about not having any in, like face-to-face -face contact with the players. So especially with the fact that we were gonna be following them over the course of 10 weeks, we had to take a lot of different factors into consideration. One of the first things we started to think about was actually what does it mean to run a 10 week long study with 20 plus, 20 plus players coming into the lab? We're very fortunate at Ubisoft Montreal that we have quite a large lab facility, but that doesn't mean that we could actually house 20 players and be able to reliably do anything with them with just the three of us. So it didn't seem quite compatible for them to be able to come in. We also wanted to ensure that they were being able to, 
you know, play at home and play over the course of 10 weeks? What did it mean that we were going to be bringing them in? How would we be actually be able to do anything with them? Because we were only three people. Would we be able to actually observe them doing anything? Could we run through interviews? Um, and we just knew that we didn't have, we weren't going to be able to call on from other, re from other resources within the lab to be able to come help us. We also had a very specific player profile that we wanted to look at for the study. So we knew we needed PC players. We knew that we wanted them to have been purchased the game within the last month. And that was kind of the, the initial base that we wanted to look at. When we sat down with the team and we looked at the tracking, we realized that we only had 4,000 of these players across all of Canada, uh, which may seem like kind of a high number, but we started to think about, okay, uh, well, we have 4,000 people all across Canada, but we're only in Montreal. What does it mean to actually narrow everything down and bring them in? Would we be able to find the players that we needed? And what, what do we feel comfortable sacrificing? Do we want to stick to the player profile or do we want to try and find players that are closest to the lab? And final, the final consideration that we really wanted to take in to discuss when we were looking at in lab versus online was this natural playing experience. It was really important to me that we not dictate to the players kind of how they were choosing their learning journey in the game. Uh, we wanted them to be able to choose what content they wanted to play, when they wanted to play it, and, and who they wanted to play it with. And this didn't quite feel compatible with having them come into the lab, having them either bring their peripherals with them, which I learned is a huge pain, but are they going to bring everything with them? Are we going to try and set them up in little cubicles in the lab? What does that mean? How long are we going to keep them there? Would they normally choose to play for that m amount of time if they were just playing at home? Would we be able to facilitate all these things? So ultimately, we had to quickly come to the, con the realization that it was going to make a lot more sense for us to run this entirely online. We wanted to be able to get the players in the profile that we wanted, and we wanted to be able to facilitate them in the most natural way possible over the course of 10 weeks. It also would allow a lot of flexibility for them as the players to be able to play when they wanted and have it be much more kind of how they would choose to play the game more naturally. The next decision we had to make was what level of players we wanted to bring in. We wanted to get an idea of how players were learning long term so having players for the long term was really important. We were aware at this point that we had a rather high churn rate of players in the first 10 to 12 hours. So we're losing a lot of players from that kind of initial onboarding experience into about the 12 hour mark, things begin to plateau and we retain more players um, after that point. We had to make the decision that we were gonna ignore the onboarding experience. Uh, for us, the initial onboarding experience is about the first five to 10 hours. You've played through some of the tutorials, you've done some of the early game content, and you've maybe played a few casual matches. It was important for us that we had players for the long term. Recruiting a lot of players is gonna take a lot of resources and a lot of time from our team to be able to get those players in. It's gonna cost us money and compensation to get players if they just drop off in a couple weeks when they realize they don't actually like the game, or worse, they try and stick it through because they wanna keep getting paid. So we decided to prioritize having players that were already active and engaged in the game and having seeing how their learning experience was shaped for over the course of the 10 weeks. I accept that there is a bias here. <laughs> we knew that this was going, we knew that we were giving, we had created a bias by looking at these players that had been after the point of the churn, and we were okay with that. Ultimately, it also came down to the fact that when we had met with the team, they had told us there was nothing that they were gonna be able to do with the early game tutorials and early game content. So we knew that we were gonna be able to gather a whole lot of information about what was going on potentially maybe explaining what was going on here, but we knew that where the development team was at the time, they wouldn't have been able to act on it. So we decided that if they weren't gonna be able to do anything with it, we would just shelve it and come back to it later. We also needed to start thinking about study kickoff. So because we weren't gonna be having the players in the lab, and I was initially quite concerned about not having any face-to-face -face contact with them, we needed to figure out how we could onboard them. 
So we did two different things. Uh, we actually, we went through the full recruitment and recruited players that fit the profile, regardless of whether, where they were in Canada. Once we had them recruited, we looked at where they were. We're fortunate that we have offices in Montreal, Toronto, and Quebec. So we decided to look at whether we had players within a 30 minute drive of those different offices. And if they were, then we would facilitate having them come into the office and we would do an on-site kickoff with them created a whole presentation talking about how the study was going to go and laid out everything. For all of our players that were not close enough to one of our studios, we hosted very small groups online, about three to four players, where I had a webcam and I went through this whole kind of onboarding presentation with them and I was going to be able to kind of start giving them a face to the name of the person they were going to be talking to over the course of this 10 weeks. We then came to thinking about participation requirements. So we're getting these players, we want them to come play for a long time, but of course we want, to have the, we want them to have a natural experience, but of course I can't spend 10 weeks not being able to kind of make some progress and gathering data and doing some analysis during that period of time. So while my goal here was really to let players go about kind of their own discovery process of learning, we did need to set some parameters to ensure that we could continue the study moving forward at a, at a steady pace. We decided that we were going to have the players have a weekly play requirement. So we were going to have them play seven hours per week, but they could play any content that they wanted whenever they wanted to but we needed them to play at least seven hours. We'd calculated that over the course of the 10 weeks, they would roughly play about 70 hours, and that each week we could rely on a consistent stream of data coming in, and we had felt pretty comfortable that the seven hours would be a good amount of time that they could play that and not become overly fatigued, and we wouldn't bias them too much. This really allowed us to keep things much more open-ended for them and letting them play the content that they wanted to play. So we were able to do that. We were able to get some context about what they were doing from tracking, but we were able to kind of say, all right, you can choose how you want to go about doing this. The final things we started to think about was the actual methods we wanted to use. Based on what I had seen from phase one, being able to actually observe the players was extremely critical knowing that they're actually not in the lab and we're not gonna be able to see what they're doing. Uh, we needed to find a nice way to be able to handle how we were going to observe them playing. We decided to use uh, Twitch for this. So we initially had tried to think about how we could use different, different internal tools, potentially having players use OBS and record videos and upload, directly, upload these videos directly to us. But then we were spending a lot of time trying to figure out, okay, where is the server? What's going to happen? What's the process? What's the reliability of players being able to upload videos? And we eventually landed on using Twitch. It's, it's a readily available tool. We assumed that most of our players were already somewhat familiar with it. And most importantly, we were having players play the live version of the game. They weren't playing anything that was unreleased. We didn't have to be concerned about any sort of leaks or anything like that because they were playing their own version of the game. So it seemed to make sense for us to be able to leverage something that didn't actually cost us anything. There's readily available help documentation online that we could just readily pull from and shuffle over to the players. And it was something that was quite easy for us to use. All of our players were gonna be in one place. They'd all have their own channels and we could just have them kind of going and storing in there. One of the next things we decided to think about was how we would handle kind of this daily diaries. So. Of course, we're running a diary study. Typically, this goes along with having a kind of daily prompt or journal where you're filling things in. So we took a lot of time thinking about how we wanted to do that. We knew that we wanted to get a lot of observation data, so we needed to, we needed to be careful about how the actual daily diaries were gonna look. And we decided to keep them to two open-ended prompts. What went well and what could have gone better? Two open boxes, that was it and just let them fill out however much they wanted to put in there and we would see how it went. We really didn't wanna prescribe anything onto them. We didn't wanna start asking them questions that would potentially be leading them to play certain content. And we just really wanted to see what are the kind of naturally occurring frustrations or difficulties? Can we get enough from just keeping things open-ended? 
We decided to keep it to just the two questions, since it was going to be kind of a lot of things, a lot of data coming in, that we wanted to be able to manage the analysis time of that. And we started to create kind of some ideas about how we could potentially be looking at keywords or doing kind of quick analysis of that. And we had them fill out this diary each time they played a session. So a session was at least uh, one match of the game. They would fill out a diary. So sometimes they were filling out multiple per week. Sometimes they were just filling out the two per week. Uh, just kind of depended on what they were playing. Another thing that I wanted to do because we were keeping the diary, the daily diary so open, was these really flexible biweekly extended questionnaires and interviews. So every other week, the players were going to have either a questionnaire or an interview in addition to the daily tasks that they were doing. Because we wanted to give them the freedom to discuss whatever they wanted in the diaries, the extended questionnaires and the interviews were going to be the direct follow-up from the diaries. So based on any sort of, if we were seeing any sort of trends coming out, were players really just starting to discuss a lot of the same things? We didn't have a lot of expectations. We just knew that we were going to pre-schedule these all ahead of time and kind of see, can we leverage that to the points of being able to dig deeper when things come up from the diaries? So we got everything scheduled. And this is what our roadmap ended up looking like. <laughs> so there's a lot of things here. We had, this is very different for us. We were trying to plan as much as we possibly could to be able to anticipate what would happen, but additionally thinking about, all right, let's plan. But then once we make that planning, that'll allow us to be very flexible about what's actually happening in between each of these points. So we have questionnaires and interviews alternating throughout. We also had a player triage, which is also very important that we pre-scheduled, where basically we just checked in with the players. How are you doing? Do you hate this game? Do you want to keep playing? Are you only motivated to play because of money? We really wanted to see kind of how they were doing, and if they wanted to drop, we were giving them the option to actually be able to make to drop. So these were very focused on kind of the mental health check is how I referred to them. We also pre-scheduled intermediary reports. So we created milestones of saying, all right, we're going to get a report to the team every two and a half weeks. I had no idea what was going to be in these reports at the time. I just knew that I was going to try and get in front of the dev team with a presentation showing them what we had been doing and being able to have a constant conversation with them rather than waiting until the very end for the final report and keeping them up to, up to date on what was happening. We also had a lot of our daily tasks. So we're looking at data compilation of our questionnaires. We're observing videos on Twitch. And we're looking at player tracking and communication. So we did this with three people. <laughs> so it was a lot of things. But by planning and doing a lot of this, we were actually able to be quite flexible in getting this done. So let's talk about actually how it went. So staying on top of everything for four and a half months, you create a lot of coping mechanisms. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and you learn a lot. Uh, so I want to share specifically about the lessons learned, uh, what we did, what went well for us, uh, what we plan to improve next time, and the actual outcome for our team. So at this point, you're probably wondering what I did with 2,000 hours of video. Uh, no, we did not actually watch all 2,000 hours of video. Uh, and that's completely OK. And that's actually going to take me into my first lesson, which may seem counterintuitive at first. Plan for the data that you expect to use. Observations were really important for us. This was data that we had never been able to look at before, and we really wanted to be able to have that kind of long-term experience following the players. What was also very important for me was that I was able to be able to randomly select which match I wanted to watch of the players playing. I didn't want the players selecting which, which content they were going to be uploading. I didn't want them to try and pick which video was best or try and having them make decisions about which videos we wanted to see. So we just told them that they should upload everything and that we would basically make the decisions about how what we would watch. This gave me the flexibility of saying, OK, you uploaded a four hour video. I'm going to go the two and a half hour mark and I'm going to find a, the beginning of a match and I'm going to watch it through and I can go back in time. I can look at the video from yesterday. It gave us a lot of flexibility based on what we were seeing at a given moment. So we ended up gathering a lot of videos because players weren't just playing the minimum requirements. We had players uploading 12-hour straight 
game sessions in one video. So we had a lot that we were looking at. So because we were bringing in so much videos of observations, we had to be very mindful about all the other data that we were bringing in. It was a lot of work being able to look through all these observations, so we had to manage the different streams of data. We fell into this trap very early on that we could just ask a million questions in our questionnaires and it would just be so great because we could capture everything, but then we just ended up getting a lot of data that we never looked at that just stressed me out because it was just sitting around and we had no, we had no direction for what we were doing. We were just saying, oh, because we can send out a survey, we should. And this became problematic because we were actually just gathering a lot of things that we couldn't do anything with or that we felt tempted to try and do something with. So we started to kind of quickly squash this mentality of, we'll come back and look at it later. We tried to be extremely mindful about what we're looking at right now and how can we leverage what we're seeing with the players happening and be more reactive in asking the questions to get that information right now. So gathering all the possible data won't necessarily give you more insights. Sometimes it just makes you a little bit more stressed. Sometimes it just gives you information that you feel like you don't actually know what to do with. Lesson two is don't be afraid to adjust. One of the ways we really stayed flexible was regularly adjusting our own protocols to really ensure that we were being as efficient as possible. We were three people and we were trying to do a lot of things all at the same time. Watching videos, while I thoroughly enjoyed watching endless hours of Rainbow Six on Twitch for many, many weeks, um, it gets really difficult to be able to kind of track how you're going to be handling these observations. What are we going to be doing? So I created this lovely Excel spreadsheet, and that's how we were going to track how we were going to do observations. It had all of our observation points. Did the player do this? Did they do that? And it created this very long spreadsheet that was unusable. And observations were taking us an extremely long time. And we weren't able to give a lot of the kind of high level insights that I was hoping for when we were thinking about learning. We were able to say, the players chose that operator. Great, but what does that actually mean? What were they trying to do? What was going on in the match? So we actually completely abandoned the Excel spreadsheet in week two, just scrapped it, <laughs> and created a mind map, something that was much more flexible, much more easy to manage, something that looked a lot easier when you're trying to go through the observations and didn't appear something like a checklist. If it appeared like a checklist, you get really tempted to check off every single box. And that wasn't helpful. I wanted to be able to make sure we were keeping things high level. So creating something that was a bit more easier to use really helped make sure that we could keep moving and getting the data that we needed. Lesson three is shift your research focus to stay on track. We created our ex expected performance statements and we had a lot of possible KPIs we were looking at at any given time. Looking at every single one of those every single week is extremely difficult, and it's really easy to get bogged down. We did this by, we decided to shift our focus each week by handling kind of weekly debriefs. So everyone, our team, everyone, all three of us, would come together and we'd have a discussion about what we're seeing, what we're, what's coming up in surveys, what trends are we witnessing, and how can we adjust for next week? When we see a lot of players mentioning that they've been watching YouTube videos, we start digging in a little bit deeper and we're gonna look at how players are discussing what they're watching in their spare time. We're gonna start asking them questions. Why are you going to YouTube to find this information? What are you looking for? What prompted you to do this? Did you find what you were looking for? And be able to kind of shift what the focus for that week was. So we weren't trying to ask every single question each and every week. This meant a lot of last minute changes to questionnaires and interviews. A lot of things were getting written very, very quickly right on the fly but we were trying to keep them quite small and manageable. So it wasn't like we were trying to write 30 questions for a questionnaire or for an interview the night before the interview. We were able to kind of make small adjustments to be able to pinpoint in and go deeper and really focus on what was happening with the players right now. Lesson four was maximizing people hours to optimize work. This goes along with kind of shifting your research focus, but staying on top of responsibilities to manage all of this over this long period of time can be quite difficult. So we created task owners to really try to reduce unnecessary overlap. So looking at kind of who's doing what, I specialized a lot in watching a lot of the videos. I had the kind of the most experience in the game. It was kind of my area of expertise. I could spend the time 
watching the videos, seeing what kind of trends we're observing there. We had someone else doing a lot of the data compilation of the questionnaires and the interviews and able, being able to say, all right, players are talking about this. All right, players are doing this. And we're able to kind of think about, okay, we're all kind of the master of our one area and we were able to get a lot more work done. Lesson five is goes along with reporting. So keeping the reports timely and relevant. We had set those kind of intermediary report scheduling for every two and a half weeks. Again, I didn't know what we were actually gonna be talking about in those reports, but it was really important to ensure that we were able to give insights to the team on a regular basis. We wanted them to have the buy-in, we wanted them to be involved in the process. So really sitting with them and asking what questions they had and seeing how we could potentially give them the answers and being able to kind of push forward and make the decisions based on what was happening in the development cycle right then because our study covered a long period of the dev cycle. And finally, lesson six was advanced technical planning is really key. So like I said, we used Twitch, which is something that's really great. It's a readily available tool. There's a lot of different online guides and help questions and help information. So we were able to quickly leverage all of this online documentation into our own kind of technical guides, which we could provide to the players. We spent a couple, we spent a couple of days in the lab twiddling with different PC specs, looking at the kind of OBS specs, thinking about how we were gonna be uploading to Twitch, what that looked like, and really created a guide and said, all right, here's the specifications of what you should do and how you can use this tool and be able to link different online sites and saying, here's the, the Twitch FAQ page. If you have any other issues, you can go here. But we were able to really leverage something that was already created. We just kind of combined it all into our own. When we did this, part of the recruitment process that we did, which was one of the, the best things that we did, was a test upload. So we found the players, they were interested in the study, they fit the profile, we said, okay, you need to upload a test video to Twitch. Here's the guide. Let us know when you're done. We had a lot of players either just not do it or they weren't able to follow directions. <laughs> so this was a really good kind of test in being able to say, okay, I wanna reduce spending time fiddling with people that don't know how to do uploads, their PC specs, their PC isn't up to spec. So we were able to say, all right, test this and we'll see how it goes. So we were able to, when we onboarded players on, we knew they already knew how to do this. They'd, they'd created their Twitch channel, they downloaded OBS, they got all the settings set up, they were able to get their, their video uploaded on Twitch and we could watch it and verify that everything was working properly. So this was a really quick, nice timeline, like nice little kind of turnaround. I also wanna discuss quickly what we're gonna improve next time. So we learned a lot, but we, of course, found some areas that we know that we could improve upon for next time. One of the things is streaming. We used Twitch, but we didn't stream. We had players uploading. We didn't want them to stream because your broadcasts aren't available for a very long time if you don't have a paid Twitch channel. I think it was roughly at the time, it was about 14 days. If you don't have a Twitch Prime, your video is only available for 14 days. I wasn't feeling confident that I was gonna be able to do observations for all of the players within that short period of time. So we'd had them upload. It wasn't until after the study that we realized how challenging and time consuming uploading was for the players. We didn't really anticipate that, pe that so many people were gonna play for 12 hours straight and that takes a really long time to upload and there's a lot of errors and they were having to calculate for that time in the week of when they were gonna actually upload those videos. My recommendation, get Twitch Prime, it's like $100, gift them the membership, the broadcasts stay online for 30 days and you can be able to access them at any time during that and you don't have to worry about video uploads, video quality having to go out because it takes too long to get it uploaded, everything just happens right in the moment while they're playing. Of course, if your game isn't released, you can look into things like YouTube. This is also something that we looked into. You can set up private YouTube channels with a verified phone number. It just wasn't something that we were necessarily concerned about because all of our content was already online anyways, but that is an option as well. The next thing we're gonna improve on is Discord. We used Google Hangouts. Turns out uh, none of our players 
know what Google Hangouts is. <laughs> uh, so it became an extra step. It worked really well. It was just an extra thing that players had to try and figure out how to use. So what we want to do is Discord. Obviously, we have concerns about the players being able to see one another while they're in a server. We've played around with it a lot, and we've been able to find ways of setting up a server where players have their own voice and chat channels and can't see one another. It takes some time, but it's possible. So this is definitely something that we want to look into in the future because all of the players are using Discord anyways. So if we had kind of random one-off comments of being able to get a hold of them, we could have just been able to pop into Discord and send them a message and they would have gotten that notification a lot sooner than something that got completely lost in Hangouts. The final piece that we want to improve upon is our all, the actual kind of online recruitment process. Turns out when you get a random email from Ubisoft saying, we want to pay you money to play our game over the course of 10 weeks, give us your social insurance number, uh, it, it lacks legitimacy. And we had a really hard time with players believing like this was too good to be true, which I don't blame them at all. <laughs> uh, we, just, we, we kind of ran out of time of being able to set something up to be able to say like, hey, here we are. Here's our research team. Here's what we're doing. Um, we did actually work with our comm dev team to get kind of a blog post where we could direct players to our blog, but even still, that was still kind of players weren't entirely sure whether that was real or not. So what we want to do is actually create a video with our comm dev team. They're really well known in the community. They're able to kind of, you know, they're figureheads within kind of people that know the scene. So we wanted to create a video with them, introduce ourselves, have them be able to see us, see our research team, discuss a little bit more about what they're going to be doing, and provide some sort of legitimacy about who we are. If anyone has any other ideas of how you can do this, when you're recruiting everything online, I'm more than open to suggestions, because this was a problem for us that actually our players did tell us after the fact uh, that things seemed a little sketchy initially. Lastly, I want to touch on what was the impact for the team. So this was something that was a considerable amount of time, which took place over 10 weeks, well, four and a half months, if you include the entire project, and what we were actually able to do within the team. Firstly, we really started to help kind of solidify this foundation in building, in, in building initiatives to decrease barriers to learning. There was a really great kind of understanding within the team that we collectively were all in this together, and this was something that we really wanted to address. One of the things that we were able to be very actively involved in is actually a new game mode that's now currently in the game as of about two weeks ago. It's the newcomer playlist. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> so the newcomer playlist was something that had been in the plans with the production for a long time, but the value wasn't quite there for them. They weren't entirely sure how a game mode entirely for newcomers could be valuable or what that would actually look like. Initially, it was set up that it would be a playlist, meaning it was a complete different kind of isolated matchmaking for players that were under a certain level, and they would, be ice they would be shown only one game mode and three different maps. Initially, the maps that were selected were the easiest maps. So they were maps that were you know, pretty long and narrow, something that weren't overly complicated, visuals were quite easy to understand, and no newcomers overall really felt like these maps were quite easy to look at and able to kind of master. Our issue here was that these maps were actually teaching bad habits, and we had seen that from the learning study. So we were able to say, actually, let's reconsider how we want to think about what this learning experience is. So one of our key kind of relationships with the team was really being able to say, let's think about the maps that we're going to choose and what that means. We really want to teach the essence of Siege. We want players to understand and learn from the earliest stages what the most important things are. So we were able to make some changes about how information is displayed to the players and what type of maps they're actually playing and ensuring that what they see in those early days is information that translates over the lifetime of the game. So this was a really big win for us, not only in being involved in the creation of this game mode, but really getting a lot of people on board within the team of saying, OK, let's really start thinking about how all of these pieces fit together. So what I've hoped you've learned today is that it's possible to run a long-term diary study with not very many people and still have a lasting impact on your team. So 
Uh, being realistic in what data you gather, um, you don't need everything. Get manageable chunks of information that you can actually use to be able to provide the insights that you need. Don't be afraid to adjust when necessary to stay on track. If you have methods that are slowing you down or aren't getting you the information that you need, it's okay to be able to shift and move away from that to get the information that you do need and that you can act upon. Plan to pivot your research to dig deeper when needed. Don't try and capture everything as, as possible every single time. It's okay to kind of pivot and narrow in and step back later. If you have a small team, dividing out tasks whenever possible really helps to optimize the work. Reduce the overlap, have people really mastering in what they're doing and being as efficient as possible in that way. When you pre-plan reporting, you can deliver relevant and timely insights and be able to ensure that you're able to keep up with the team and the questions that they have because you're a bit more manageable about when you're expected to get those things done. And finally, advanced technical planning is key to using tools to your advantage. Think about what tools your players are already familiar with. Think about tools that are already free and accessible for them and how you can leverage information that's already available online to be able to push that to them for them to be able to be part of the study. That is all I have. Thank you. <laughs> Johnny. Did it have an effect on churn? We didn't look at churn. That graph more or less equals. We never, Fox. we ignored, we started after the churn. Right. We recruited players at the about 12 to 15 hour mark into the study. So we completely just bypassed that section entirely. So when the players came in, they already were past that point. Do you have? Even after that, did, I mean, did you see that the new, like, I'm assuming the idea of other Learning study 2.0 coming this summer. <laughs> I'll get back to you. <laughs> so the newcomer playlist released two weeks ago. So we are looking at what's happening in the game, but I can't definitively say anything at this time. Uh, we, are running, we are running this again in June. So I'll get back to you when I know, but hopefully. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is a really cool study, uh, really awesome. It Thank seems you. like work that would be really cool to do and really awesome learnings. Uh, the thing that I'm interested in is like how you get the business or the dev team signed on to something that's so exploratory and that isn't necessarily like, oh, we're exactly trying to reduce churn or we're trying to solve this specific problem. Because it seems like it would be a dream to do this type of work, but hard yeah. sometimes to get teams on board. So kind of two things. One, we're very fortunate that our team is quite uh, accepting of research. Um, where we were when we started the study, we were a very data heavy team very data heavy. Qualitative research wasn't exactly our area of interest. Uh, so this was like entirely different from something that we had done. Keeping them very involved really helped. Sitting them down at the very beginning and say, what do you expect players to be able to do? What questions do you have? It was kind of this interesting thing that we'd never been able to do before. And that really piqued their interest in being able to say, yeah, I kind of wonder what that looks like. We had a lot of expectations, of course, most of our devs on our team had been playing for hundreds of hours. So they're like, oh, players are gonna be able to do this and be able to do that. And it was not entirely accurate. So being able to keep them involved and doing this kind of regular reporting and discussing with them really helped. I mean, from the first report to the last report, it was like a couple people in a room to standing room only. Like we got a lot of interest kind of over time. You mentioned um, mind maps as, yes. a, as a method. Do yeah. you mind going over that a little bit more in detail? Yeah, so our observation, we used, uh, we used mind maps to do our observations. So how we had divided it out was kind of the structure of the game flow. So you're either playing an attack or defense um, and kind of looking at these kind of different facets. So the expected kind of performance statements. We, back, we kind of grouped all of those into different facets and started thinking about, okay, how do we divide this thing out? The natural progression of the game is you get in, if you're playing as an attacker, you immediately get pushed to a drone. So what are they doing when they're droning? Did they use, you know, what were they doing during prep phase? Did they preserve the drone? As soon as action phase start, did they use their second drone? What did they do? 
Did they make call outs when they were on it? So these were just kind of segmented questions in the mind map uh, based on kind of, you know, there was a drone tag and you could make any comments about what they were doing with drones. You could do the same thing with the kind of cameras. How are they utilizing the map cameras? What were they doing? So I really liked how you used tools that were within like the realm of the gaming, like with Twitch and Discord eventually. Yes. <laughs> Did you uh, ever think about any other like specific diary study tools that are like out there in terms of like D-Scout, um, I don't know, Qualboard, like those like tools that are more specific for diary studies? And Yeah. So I really wanted to use something that was going to be kind of the least friction as possible. Yeah. Um, like Google Hangouts was like a fail. Uh, but... This was why Twitch was actually so appealing. I was quite against it at first. Julian can uh, attest to that. I was not sure how it was going to work. Uh, but really using something that was most people are kind of aware of was really nice. So I had some concerns about trying to say, I need you to play the game, but I also need you to download this app. And I also need you to like use this kind of tool that's so specialized to something that they don't typically use. So we really wanted to try and stay in that realm. Uh, Berg. Excellent case study. This was super cool. I have a million questions, but my one for now. I would love to talk to you after. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> bad, bad decision. Um, so my question here is, your initial goal, you started off with your average player. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious as to if you can expand and tell me off if, if this is an appropriate question, but why you were looking at the average instead of what you would consider to be your successful players? Because it seems like they would be your more valuable cohort, like what the journey looks like from beginner to successful as opposed to mm -hmm. beginner to average. Great question, and I'll try and answer it as succinctly as possible. Uh, we have a really wide range of potential players and looking at the most successful, I think might tend up towards pro league, which is completely unattainable. Like what does successful mean? So to me, it was kind of average felt like this kind of more easy to grasp definition. Whereas if we started to think about what does a good player look like? What does a successful player look like? My concern is that the team would skew too high. And so we started to look at, okay, when we look at the actual kind of bell curve of where our players sit, we started to say, okay, I'm gonna get technical for a second, but we have a ranking. And so we have players that kind of fall in gold three and gold four, it's their MMR, it's kind of looking at where they sit. That's the biggest portion of our population. So we said, there's what's going on here? Those are our kind of average players. They represent the largest demographic of our players. So that's kind of how we created that idea. Uh, I, I think there's probably multiple other ways we could have done it. It was just, what do we do with this kind of large population? What's going on here? And what does that mean? Yeah. John? Uh, you mentioned that you gave, you know, you had kind of, you mentioned you had some kind of defined exit points during the course of the study. Yeah. Uh, what was your completion rate for participants? We recruited 24. We ended with 20. So, yeah, it was more than I needed. Um, so we, <laughs> uh, we, we anticipated that we would actually have a lot more players drop. It was 10 weeks over the summer. So a lot of our players were college students looking for jobs. Uh, this was a reasonable amount of kind of pay, and they were just playing games at home. Uh, so we did expect to lose quite, quite a few more than that. Uh, so we captured that kind of in the, the triage, kind of seeing how they were doing, and that's when we were able to evaluate, hey, maybe it's not appropriate for you to continue if you're feeling like this is not something you want to do. Uh, yeah. So when you're doing things like using Discord, like our oh, Sorry, excuse me, can you please? I will, thank you. <laughs> um, so when you're using Google Hangouts and you're using yeah. Twitch to basically have the videos uploaded, did InfoSec care about any of that kind of stuff from like a sensitive data standpoint or like were you free to kind of do what you needed to do? With the, the information that was there? Yeah, like when they were uploading videos, like gameplay, or like if you're asking for, you know, feedback and like your diary study itself. Yep, so the we used a proprietary internal tool for surveys. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of covered there. Uh, as far as the Twitch videos, we weren't asking them. We were very specific to them, like, don't disclose any information. This is a video going online. Like, 
here's the parameters of what you can talk about when you're recording your video. But I mean, after the course of 10 weeks, it's like, hey, Lainey, I'm getting down and I'm going to play and this is going to be great. And they're like talking to me and doing think aloud while I'm watching their video. Um, so with the videos, it was quite difficult for us to control. We did try and give parameters to them of like, hey, don't talk about sensitive information. But we weren't giving them anything that had to be NDA'd because it was their version of the game that they had purchased. Um, and with questionnaires, we had our kind of internal tool that we were using. Thank you. Uh, I Do we have time for more? I think one more. Oh, one more? Okay. Um, you mentioned that you had over 2,000 hours of play. I wanted to ask um, how many hours of video did you actually watch per week? And per hour of video, how much time did you spend analyzing that video? Yeah. I got really good at watching videos really quickly because mm -hmm. um, that was basically all I was doing all day. Um, was just looked like I was just sitting at my desk watching Twitch videos and everyone around me was like, I'm not sure she's actually working. Um, so we got much more efficient at it because we started having a real mastery of the game the more time we spent observing the videos. So our overall analysis time was quite quick. We tried to watch, kind of we scaled about how many matches we were gonna watch each week, but it usually averaged to about kind of two hours of video and I tried to make sure that we were doing a lot of the kind of analysis of what we were doing kind of live with that. So you may want to add a little bit of time on top of that. But I really stress that we wanted to take observations as we were going and be able to see pinpoint times, okay, maybe we need to come back to this later. Uh, but it was not extremely heavy. We were, the videos we were watching and doing the analysis was maybe taking us another extra hour on top of that per player. Thank you. Are we out of time? Oh, okay. Oh, we have one more? Oh, sorry. It's just closed this session and kind of like break next. Okay. Well, if there aren't any questions, or I can touch base with people after. Oh, did you have a question? Yeah. Right here. Okay. Yeah, thank you for a great talk. I really like it. So uh, my question is, um, for the first time user experience um, th that has um, I, I would imagine like um, you don't want to influence the first time user experience. Uh, the placements were all on their own. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I, w I, I would guess in their very uh, early couple hours, um, if like m there may be other factors that will influence their uh, learnability, like uh, which side they played, which map they played, which operator they use. Um, uh, my first question is if those factors, if those problems will pop up during the uh, test. And if that's the case, um, how would you control the scope of the test? Like, uh, are you going to dig more about the details or something like this? We are looking into, so like I would mentioned before, when we recruited players into the study, they already had about 12 to 15 hours. So they had already played that kind of initial first time experience. We knew we weren't going to be able to do anything at the time with that information. Um, things may have changed, and we may be able to look at that information now. Uh, but we really kind of started with where they started with 12 to 15 hours and tracked kind of how that went. What I'd like to do for the next time is actually compare what's going on from what we saw at that 12 to 15 hour, how long it's taking players to get there, and what's kind of happening in between. Uh, but for this study, we couldn't really say a lot for that because we, we made the choice to look at after that. So, okay, thank you.